Bless in your word. You speak with purpose and with intention. So, Father, I ask that I will not say what you have not spoken today. I submit my mental faculty. I submit my voice. I submit my thoughts to you. I pray that they will be guided by the Spirit of God. And I will speak with purpose, with precision, with power. And I will speak the same way you will have spoken if you were to be here physically. And your people will receive it and be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to conclude our message series for now. Because we'll do a, a few other things for the next few weeks. But I believe this is a message that God, that, that God has brought to us. And I want you to please pay attention to it. Uh, if you have not, I think uh, you should please listen to the first two parts. Uh, it is good to listen to it over and over again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Multiple hearing. Sometimes you hear once, some things you miss. That's how our brains are wired. Our brains can absorb everything being said in the span of 40, 45 minutes. There's something you're going to miss. Especially if you're not writing notes, which seems like a lost art now in our days. Amen. Uh, but you can, you know, we have the technology to listen over and over again so that you can be blessed. Amen. Uh, I'm going to try to just summarize a little bit what we talked about in the first, in the last two weeks. In the first week, we opened a message series called Life Portfolio by describing you know, that, that our life is a portfolio of investment, all right? Now, you as a person, you're not just one thing. You're a portfolio. You are multi-sided. You, you know, there's so many components to your life. And you should see life not just as a race, which many people do, or not just as a warfare, which some people do, but you should see life as a a portfolio of investment. Life is a product of investment. The Bible will use the word sowing and reaping. All right? But I decided to use the word investment because many of us can connect with it very well. Amen. What is an investment? An investment is an asset or something that you acquire with the goal of generating income or appreciation. You know, an investment is something you want to increase. It's different from something you consume. Your life is an investment. A portfolio simply means a range of investment. That means there's so many things about your life. You're not just one thing. You're multiple things. You're a father. You're a mother. You're an employer, an employee. You're a business person. You're a creative person. You're a worshiper. You're a singer. You know, you're an encourager. Many of us, we are different things. You're a mother. You're a father, a wife, a husband. You know, all these areas, the Lord expects you to improve, increase, and multiply in every area. And that's what investment does. Praise the name of Jesus. And last week, we talked about you as the greatest asset, right? We talked about investing in yourself simply because the greatest asset you have is you, all right? And as a believer, especially, God has put so much in you. God has put so much potential in you because he has put Christ in you. He has put the Holy Spirit in you. He has given you natural gift, natural talent. But all those things, they are raw. They are residing in you. All right? They are you know, what we call intrinsic value. You know, they, they have not been realized yet. And the way our intrinsic value becomes it's extrinsic, something that we can really make something of, is processing, Right? And we use um, uh, Proverbs 12, 27 as a, you know, a verse that I kind of spoke about a little bit, that, that a lazy person will not roast what he took from hunting or will not roast their game, will not, you know, will not perfect their craft, all right? We just sell themselves raw. Many times we sell ourselves raw. We have so many gifts, we have so many talents, we have so many graces, we have so many anointing, but they are raw. They need to be fine-tuned. They need to be processed so they can really earn much more. And that, is, that requires an investment from us, a lot of investment in translating what God has put in us. Apostle Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is in you. 
Hallelujah. The gift was put there. In fact, the gift was put there by laying on of earn. And rather, the gift was received by impartation. All right? You know, the, the gift was put there. And that's how we receive things from God. What we receive from God is gift. It's imported into us. But it's our responsibility to steer them up. It's our responsibility to fine-tune them, to make sure they are things that can produce results. Praise the name of Jesus. You know, I'm going to conclude today by just giving us, you know, a charge to invest your life. Because we talked about this, you know, the title of the, the theme is Life Portfolio, Investing Your Life Wisely. You know, so I want to charge you to make sure you invest your life uh, wisely. Because, you know, you must, in order to invest your life wisely, you must put on a mindset of an investor. You must live like an investor. Investors, they have a different kind of mindset. Investors don't spend mindlessly. That's why they are investors. They are selective. In fact, they selectively spend on things that produce great return. That's why they are different. That's why they are different. They selectively you know, invest on things. Now, we're talking about money now, but this is not about money per se. I'm talking about how you live your life, all right? This is, so, but we must follow that same principles. Investors, they see beyond the invisible, and that's why they are different. Investors, you know, when they see a $100 bill, an investor doesn't just see a $100 bill. That's why it's different. So an investor is able to see the potential of a $100 bill, right? You know, every, you, know you see a $100 bill, you see a shoe, you see a bag, <laughs> right? <laughs> you see, you know, that's all we see. Ordinary people, that's what we see. Investors see a $100 bill, they see a $1,000. They see the potential. They see what this can earn them in future. They automatically see what this can become. And that guides them so that, you know, if you're able to see that way, it affects how you live. It affects how you spend your money, for example, if it's physical. If you see your life like that also, it affects how you spend your energy, right? If you see your gift like that, it affects how you, how you spend it. It's very, very important. So investors have that incredible ability to see beyond the visible. So because of that, they are governed by that knowledge. The knowledge of the potential of what they see governs them. Hallelujah. And that's why investors are knowledgeable. If you want to really, really be an investor, you must be someone that is knowledgeable. Investors think long term, right? They don't just think now. You know, they think long term, and that's very, very important. So in order for us to live like them, we must have that same mindset about our life. I'm going to have us read a scripture in Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 9 and 10, because this is very, very relevant. God wants us to live like investors. I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to read verse 9 and 10. Look at what he says. As the heavens are higher than the earth... So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thought than your thoughts. And look at verse 10. It says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bird and flourish, so that it yields seed to the sower and bread for the eater. He continue by saying that is how the word of God is. You know, that is how God's blessing is. So he's saying that when God blesses us, you see, God blesses us, everything that God gives to us, a portion of it is a seed and a portion of it is bread. Did you get that? Everything that God blesses you with, whether it's money, whether it's gift, your time inclusive, you know, your time, your energy, everything God has blessed you with, when God blesses you, you must have a mindset that a portion of it is a seed to be sown, right? And a portion of it is a bread to be eaten. Now, I'm not just talking about seed in terms of seed you sow in church. You know, oftentimes we kind of really make this only about that. 
but this is in, in a larger context now that a farmer, for example, a farmer thinks like an investor. And a farmer sows and they reap and they harvest, the farmer automatically knows, right, that I must sow back some of this seed, right, because that is what is going to become my harvest next year. And a wise farmer actually want to increase what they sow, right? That's why you start gradually. So a farmer will, what a farmer will do is actually select what they are going to invest or sow first. They don't eat and say, oh, if you have something left over, we're just going to plant it. No, no, no. That's not how a wise farmer operates. A wise farmer will look at what they have gathered and pick the best. Isn't that so? The best the richest, the most, you know, the one that the most viable, right? They select them and put them aside and they're going to say, you know what, this is what we're going to plant against next year. That's how we should live our life. We should res reserve a portion of everything we have for as investment, something to sow, something to plant for the future. For the future. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, People who lack understanding, they don't do that. They don't live their life like that. They get all their finances and they just consume. And they say, you know what? You know, I'm going to give. You know, if I have something left, if I have something less, I'm going to save. I'm going to invest. You know, and what happens? You don't have nothing left. You know? And, they, and you're going to say, you know what? Uh, you know, maybe when I get a raise, I will have something left. Right? You get a raise, you look at your paycheck, the difference is very little, right? Isn't that it? You get 3% rate, 5% rate. You know, you're expecting it to be big. By the time Uncle Sam took so much out of it, you're like, wow, this old $5,000 raise is like $50 on my paycheck. And you're going to say, you know what, maybe when I get another job, you know, I'm going to really be able to do that. By the time you get another job, oh, you think about you need another car. Isn't that what happened? You know, and the job is a little further away, so you spend more on gas now, right? And, and now, because the job is kind of is in the city now, people really tend to go out for a for nice lunch, right? Like your, you know, you that used to carry your lunch in a bag before, now it doesn't, it's not cool anymore, right? You kind of want to go out, 15 bucks every day by the end of the week. I mean, you know, by the time you put that together, you are back to where you used to be, really. Or maybe worse off financially, and you're going to say, you know what? Maybe when I get another job, I'm going to start doing something. I mean, that's how ordinary people behave. And that's what we also do with our time. We say, you know what, I'm going to really go to school when I can get a time. I'm going to really spend on studying, improving myself if I can get a time, if, I, if this can work. You know what, you know, the cost of going to school is so much, you know what, maybe I'm just going to try and, you know, do two jobs and be able to survive for now, you know. We never invest time, you know, to improve ourselves because it is a portion of your time must also be used as an investment. In fact, the best of your time should be used for that. You must apportion the best of your time for self-improvement, whether in your career, your spiritual life. All those things are very, very important if you're going to really be successful in life. Praise the name of Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us to learn from the ant, the scripture we read today. Isn't that amazing what you can find in the Bible? It's amazing. Look at what Proverbs said. In Proverbs chapter 6, we're going to go back there if you can just uh, project that. He said, go to the ant, you sluggard. You see, sluggard, I've discovered that sluggards and lazy people, people are not lazy because they are not running around. Right? The reason why people are lazy is not because they are not running around. In fact, some, a lot of lazy people are applying energy. They are just applying the energy in the wrong place. All right? I mean, look at the energy to beg. I mean, so it takes a lot. <laughs> it takes a lot. It takes a lot. You know? You know, to borrow money from this person, borrow money from this person, and you avoid them. It takes a lot of calculation. It takes a lot of... Uh, I mean, it takes a lot of, takes a lot of weeks, right, to really plan how you're not going to run into this person. The next lie I'm going to tell them, you know, some of these things. It's a lot of energy. If that energy is rightfully applied in somewhere else, I mean, you could actually be doing better. Praise the name of Jesus. So, you know, so 
being lazy doesn't necessarily mean someone is just sleeping. You know, there's a lot of lazy people who are running around, expending a lot of energy. So, and because of that, they don't think they are lazy. But he's saying, go to the ant, you sluggard. Its ways are, I mean, its ways and be wise. You know, observe his ways and be wise. It had no commander. They have no commander, overseer, or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in the summer and gathers its food at harvest. You know? And he said, look, they know. They, they, they know. You see, the ants know there's a time when it's going to be very difficult to be outside. All right? It's going to be very difficult. You know, there's a winter coming, right? The, you know, so during the harvest, during the spring, during the, you know, when, when the weather is good, they store up things. You know, they come to your houses, come to your kitchen, you know, they go everywhere they can, you know, and they just pile up. They pile up, they pile up. They understand that there's a time when it's not going to be comfortable to go out and they feed on what they, what they have gathered. And somehow, they know how much to gather. It's in them. And he's saying, we should study that. We should study. And you know what? Our life is like that. There's a time we have a lot of energy. There's a time where we're not going to have a lot of energy. All right? There's a time we earn. There's a time we're not going to be able to earn so much. So the Bible is saying we should learn that. We should learn that because that is very, very important. We must learn to invest our life wisely. And I, my challenge for you is, are you just spending your life? Or are you, in, or are you investing it? Are you just living, just spending? Or are you taking time to invest? Are you just spending all your money? Or are you investing some of it? Are you just spending your energy or are you investing? A good portion of our life should be spent on activities that improves us. That's very important. If you get nothing today, get this. A good portion of your life should be spent on activities that improves you. Your life your money, your time, everything, a good portion of it. You know, should be spent on something that in, because that increases your value. All right? Even your career, you must increase your value. It doesn't, you're not necessarily performing at your peak. You're not. You're not necessarily performing at your peak. There are so many things you are capable of doing that you're not doing yet. And that needs some drilling. He needs some drilling to be, able to, to be able to get it out. In fact, in Proverbs 20, verse 5, the Bible says, Purposes in the heart of man is like deep waters. But the one who has insight or a man of understanding will draw them out. I want you to project that if you can. Hallelujah. You have it? If you can, that will be good. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs 20, verse 5. All right, Proverbs 25. I'd like everyone to be able to see that. Hopefully they can, you know. Proverbs 20, verse 5. All right, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters. They are deep. They are deep. But one who has insight or one who has understanding, figure out how to draw them out. There are so many things deep inside of you. For some of us sitting now, there are books sitting deep inside of you. For so many of us sitting here now, there are business ideas sitting deep inside of you. For so many of us sitting there, there are spiritual gifts sitting deep inside of you. There are ministries sitting deep inside of you. There are, there are so many things sitting deep inside of you. But only a person who has understanding knows how to drill it out. Someone with understanding knows how to fish it out, knows how to steer it up, right? Knows how to figure out how to bring it out. They don't just come out. They need some drilling. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Are you ready for the drilling? 
Are you ready for some drilling? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I'm going to wrap up really by taking us to Genesis chapter 41. You know, Genesis chapter 41, I want to really make that as my, as, as an illustration that I think will really help many of us. Genesis 41. So Genesis 41 is the story of um, uh, Pharaoh and Joseph. Very, very, very interesting story. My, my thing is getting slow a little bit. All right. What's going into our Wi-Fi? Hallelujah. All right. So I think I'm almost there now. So let's do Genesis 41. Are you all there? I want you to open it because I think uh, you're, you should really be able to mark up or highlight some of them. Uh, let's, if you go to uh, verse 20-something, uh, you're going to see that Pharaoh had a dream. Very interesting story. Pharaoh had two dreams, actually. He had two dreams. In one of those dreams, he said he was standing by the river, uh, the bank of the river, and out of the river came seven cows, seven cows that were fat and slick. And those cows were grazing among the reeds. I mean, very fat cows, seven of them. And after then, other cows came. They were very ugly. They were lean, emaciated. And he said, I've never seen such ugly cows in my life. But as he was watching in this dream, something strange happened. The lean, emaciated, ugly cow went after the fat cow and ate them. And after they ate them, it didn't even look like they've eaten anything. <laughs> they still look as ugly as before. Wow. He had another dream that is just like the same. You know, he saw grain that is full and good. He was growing in a single stalk. And he saw another, you know, another seven others that sprouted. They were withered and thin. And the thin heads of the grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I mean, so it, was, it, was, it must have been a very vivid dream. Because when he woke up from the dream, he was like, wow, this, is, this must mean something. This is not some random, ate too much last night and I dreamt. No, this is something vivid. So he needed interpretation. And he told all the magicians, you know, he was, he was an unbeliever king, so he had a lot of his voodoo people, you know, they came to say, can you tell me what this dream mean? And none of them could explain. Now, a few years before, Joseph had interpreted some dreams in the prison for some of his guys they met in the prison. And he had told them, look, one of them was working for Pharaoh. In fact, he was Pharaoh's butler, the guy that served Pharaoh drinks. He was working in the White House, pretty much. You know, and, in the, you know, and because of, I mean, and Joseph's interpretation led to him being released and restored back to his position. And, he, and Pharaoh said, look, please remember me when you get to Pharaoh. Of course, he got there and he forgot, you know. Now, all of a sudden, while all this was going on, the Holy Ghost brought this to his remembrance. And he said, wow, I remember. There is a guy that is in prison. And King said, prison? Yeah, the problem is he's in prison. <laughs> but he can interpret dreams, dreams. As a matter of fact, he has this gift of interpretation, and he interpreted my dream. And Pharaoh said, go and bring him. Go and bring him. So they brought Joseph. And when Joseph came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh, you know, narrates his dream, narrated the dream for him, and he said, I need interpretation. I was told you can do it. Um, first of all, jo uh, Joseph said, no, I cannot. But I have a God who can. Hallelujah. That's very powerful if you read that story. So, in verse 28, after, after Pharaoh narrated the dream, I mean, just watch me. I'm going somewhere with this, uh, with this story. After, after Pharaoh narrated the dream to Joseph, so Joseph now gave him the interpretation, very powerful interpretation. And he said, 
God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. This is verse 28 now. And he said, seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. But seven years of famine will follow them. I want you to notice Joseph is a very significant person in the Bible. Joseph is a, is a type of Jesus. Joseph is a typology of Christ. You know, Joseph is also a type of all of us. We are all Josephs. We are all people. In fact, we're going to do a message series about Joseph later in the year. We are all Joseph. We are all people carrying dreams, visions. You know, we are all beloved. Don't forget, Joseph is the beloved of the father. He was the man with, uh, you know, coats of many colors. He was a man, and you remember, Joseph was sold, you know, by his own brothers. Just as Jesus was sold by his own brothers. You know, there's a lot of similarity and parallel. Joseph is really God communicating to us about Jesus Christ. So Joseph is a very significant person in the scripture and in understanding the scripture. Seven is significant. Seven is, seven represents season. Seven is obviously number of perfection, but seven in the context of time also represents dispensation. You know, when you hear the Bible says the rain, I mean, you know, seven days makes one week. Seven years of, anti, you know, of, uh, of the reign of Antichrist. Seven just means a block of time, a season. So these are very, very powerful code things, maybe code words being used here. So Joseph is saying here, there's a season in your, in, that is coming. It's called season of abundance. And it's the seven years of famine will follow. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten. And the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered. Because the famine that follows will be so severe. And verse 32, Joseph said, the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God. And God will do it soon. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure Pharaoh was weak. Pharaoh was weak. Now, but the good thing about this, why I love this story is, is it's just so full, so well-rounded. You know, Joseph here had a, you know, he had a, he had a powerful gift of interpretation that is coupled with word of knowledge. So he's able to really give this dream accurate interpretation. But you see, Joseph went beyond that. That's why I love Joseph. That's why Joseph is Jesus. Jesus doesn't just give us the problem, he gives us the solution. Hallelujah. So Joseph is not like some of those prophets who tell you, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I had a bad dream about you, and that's what is going to happen. And you just walk away just like, wow, I, I guess I'm doomed. <laughs> no, I guess nothing is going to No, no, no. Joseph provided solution, provided wisdom. And he didn't even wait in verse 33. And he said, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man. He gave him wisdom. So Pharaoh should look for a discerning and wise person and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land. Now, there was nothing in the background of Joseph. He never went to, he never went to MBA, never did MBA, no business school. He was never a businessman. He was never somebody that has acquired this thing in such a way. He was never a politician. He was never somebody that studied the political science. But look at what he's, look at what he's giving here. That can only come from the Lord. This is a revelation directly from God, and they have significance. They have meaning to our lives also today. Because the Bible says all these things happen for our examples, and they were written for our admonition. Praise the name of Jesus. I want you to look at what Pharaoh said. Let Pharaoh, I mean, what, what uh, Joseph said, let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land and take a fifth of the harvest. A fifth is what? 20%. Take 20% of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt 
so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. You know, of course, I mean, you have to give it to Pharaoh. He's wise. He's wise to know who to appoint. And he said, oh, I guess we're appointing you now. <laughs> I mean, who else are we? I mean, I mean, where did these numbers come from? You know, I mean, 20, 20% 20 now. Where did 20 come from? See, 20 is a spiritual number. Because logically, 20 doesn't really make sense like that. Because if you consume 80%, and you save 20 percent oh, for seven years, 20 times seven is 140. All right? But you look, you need 80 percent per day. I'm a mathematician, so I can calculate things quite well. Yeah? So after seven years, you have saved really one and a half days' worth of food. You know, because if you need 80, you're at 140 now, right? If you need 80, uh, you have 60 left. Let's say you manage it, you should have two years of food. That's where that number is, div is divine. It's, not just, it's just not numbers. It is something that came from heaven because that 20% became something that fed Egypt for seven years, but it wasn't something that fed Egypt. It was something that Egypt was able to sell to all other nations around during that seven years. Don't forget that is what brought Joseph's brothers we were, because it was a regional famine, it was a regional recession. All right? They didn't have Joseph where they were living. There was no Joseph. There was no likes of Joseph. The famine was killing them. They had to look for where there was food. They looked all around the world, all around the region. The only place where there was food was Egypt. We need Josephs in our lives. We need Josephs. We need Josephs. We need Josephs. So that's very, very important. Now, so that 20, you know, 20 itself is multiples of 10. You see? So 20 simply means double 10. 10 is a significant, when it comes to investment, 10 tend to really come out a lot. In fact, people will say, averagely, you should invest 10%, right? Of your income. If you, if you start working today, you know, if you invest 10%, of your income over the period of your working years, you are going to be able to live very well after retirement. You know, those numbers just, you know, you can see how much they fit, all right? Very, very, very important. As believers now, look at it. Let me, let me just give you a thought here. As believers, don't forget that we are investing in two places, right? As believers, we're not just investing for this age, we're also investing for future. And what is that base number that we tend to use? Tithing, right? So it seems to me that, you see, there's a combination here. 20 means a lot to us. That if you're a believer, you are investing not only for this world, you are investing also eternally. And those are equally important to us if you are going to be successful. And you can apply that to even every aspect of your life. Investing 10% of anything you have, of your time, of everything, will always yield increase for the future. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's go to the scripture and look at a few more verses here. I said for a believer, there are two kinds of futures that we have, every believer. You have what we call the temporary future, right? The now future. The this age future, right? Our future is in front of us. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of blessings for that future. There's a lot of promises of God that covers that future. In fact, a lot of God's promises tend to cover both. You know, I look at Luke, excuse me, I look at Luke chapter 18. You know, Jesus was talking to the disciples. He said, truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home, or wife, or brothers, or sisters, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom, we fail to receive many times as much in this age, in the age to come, eternal life. Hallelujah. You see, no one will fail to receive blessing. And, the, and he's saying that you are going to receive it many times and as much in this age and in the age to come, all right? 
You see, he's saying that, you know, when you give up something from God, you are taking care of the age now, right? And the one that is to come. So Jesus is saying, I care about you. I care about your future. If you read Matthew 5, I mean Matthew 6, it talks about take no thought for your life, right? What you shall eat, what you shall drink, you know, what you shall put on. And it talks about how God cares for us. Isn't that what he says? So God cares about us now. He cares about your future now. But he wants you to invest for that future, right? He has given us wisdom for that future. He has given us wisdom to really succeed in that future. He has given you the seeds. Those seeds come in terms of money. Those seeds come in terms of, you know, strength. Those seeds come in terms of talent, in terms of your, your gifting, in terms of your, you know, what, and your gifting is what leads to your career now. You must invest in that for the future so that you can increase, so you can appreciate, so can, you can learn, you can earn more. All right? You can improve. You must invest your time in your spiritual life. All right? It's not just going to jump on you. You must invest time in studying the Word. You must invest time in praying. You must invest those time in your life so you can get something better out of it. So you are not in the same place. Some people worry, I'm, I'm just in the same place. You are in the same place because you have not invested. Everybody is equally anointed. Everybody is anointed. Everybody has the same Holy Spirit. You know, there's no male Holy Spirit, female Holy Spirit. There's no junior Holy Spirit. You know, we all have the same Spirit lives in us. Hallelujah. You know, we have all been gifted. You know, we have all been anointed by God. You know, we are all hears and we are all joint hears. I mean, we are all equal when it comes to value in the presence of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Yes, we have been assigned different ministries, different assignments we've been given, but we are all called to equally excel in what we have been given. If you are called to be a businessman, excel in it. If you are called to be a pastor, excel in it. If you are called to be a singer, excel in it. If you are called to be a professional on Wall Street, excel there. But that excelling there requires some investment. Praise the name of Jesus. So we must invest for our temporary future. No believer should live their life without investing for their future. It is an assault on the word of God. It is a disgrace to God that we serve. We should not just live our life just saying, you know, God will take care of you. No, he's not. He wants you to take care of you. You are in charge. You are in control. Don't just push it and say, you know, I don't need life insurance. I don't need this. You know, God, no, 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 no. You are being, being foolish. Please. Don't be foolish. God does not side on the side of foolish people. Go, go and read Proverbs. You see how much he hates foolish people. Foolish people are people who don't apply the knowledge. You know, they might be praying, but they don't apply the knowledge. You know, they might be jumping up and down, they don't apply knowledge. They can sleep in church, they, can, they don't apply knowledge. You know, some of the people in church can be the most foolish people because they wrongly apply or refuse, they hide behind spiritual lingos to excuse themselves of what responsibility that God has placed on them. Praise the name of Jesus. So we have a temporary future that we must invest towards. You know, if you are young here, you must invest. Don't just, don't just think the money that comes to you is just for you to enjoy and spend. You're thinking of car. You see car that somebody who has worked 30 years is driving, and that's what you want now. I mean, what, how, how is that going to happen? How are you going to be able to have a great future? You know, you're just burning everything that comes to you. In fact, the time to do it is now. Praise the name of Jesus. Some of us are older. You need to play catch up. You need to play catch up. Invest. Play catch up. Invest in your health. Don't just live anyhow. I had to do a colonoscopy a few days ago. Don't feel sorry for me. I, you know, it's... 
you know, they reduce that age now. I think they drop it to 45 for men now. So if you have a husband 45 and above and he hasn't done it, you have my permission <laughs> to make the house uncomfortable for them. And you have, a, you have a wife who is 50 speaking in tongues and saying, I'm not going to the doctor. You have my permission to make the house uncomfortable for them. Don't just live all your life anyhow. I had to do it. I had to do it now because I don't have faith. Because I value my body, right? This body is a gift from God. If I trash it and treat it anyhow, the horse will die before the message can get to where it is going. I need this horse because this message must go to the hands of the world. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So it's very important to take care of your body, whatever you need to do, exercise, eat right, you know, don't, don't put 10 sugars in one cup of uh, coffee. I mean, and live like that. Don't do all those things. I mean, just don't, don't let us live like crazy people. I mean, we, we are in control. We have the Holy Spirit. Having the Holy Spirit means we have self-control. I mean, that means we are not controlled by things. We are not controlled by food. You know, you don't, you don't just eat all the food that they put in front of you. You're, you're being controlled by food. You are controlled by everything. No, that is not the life God has called us to live. Hallelujah. How many of us are enjoying this message? Are you being blessed? Amen. Now, the last one we have is eternal future. The second one we have is eternal future. As believers, we also have what is called eternal future that we must constantly invest in. All right? Let's read. I'm going to read a few scriptures. Uh, I'm going to read a few scriptures. First Timothy chapter 6. I'll read 2. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 17, 18, and 19 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Don't put your hope in wealth. It's so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Yeah, he wants us to enjoy, to enjoy. But look at verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That's verse 18. I want you to look at verse 19. We have it on the screen. We're having challenges. Okay. Look at it on your phone, on your iPad. Okay. Verse 19 says, In this way, they will lay up treasure. I want you to listen to this. Treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life <laughs> there's a life that is truly life there's a life beyond this life so he's saying command so paul is telling timothy to command them so i'm commanding you to be to do good to be rich in good deeds to be generous and be willing to share he says when you do that you're doing something. You are laying up treasure for yourself as a firm foundation for the coming age. So the way we invest in our future is through giving, right? All manners of giving. So don't, don't cringe when they do offering here. Don't, don't say, oh, they've come again, church is up. No, 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 no. I mean, don't, don't say all those things. Don't let, don't be deceived by people who don't understand the faith, who don't understand the word of God, who try to confuse you, who try to, you know, mess up your mind out there. This is the word of God. Amen. Matthew 6, I'm going to read verse 19 through 21. Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth. Now, the accurate interpretation of that is, on earth alone where moth and vermin destroy see in five last week in five days the market lost 11 points just in five days they were talking about people lost billions some people some people probably had a heart attack just 
coronavirus. Coronavirus has wiped out billions of people's money. I mean, that's, that's what can happen to money that we have. I mean, this is the strongest economy in the world. The fundamental is strong. But in five days, some people have lost half of their wealth. Some people much more. Just in five days, coronavirus that started in China, in some village. Look at what it has cost the whole world. That is how fickle worldly wealth is. And he's saying, don't just store up your treasure, you know, on earth. Where moth and burning destroy. And where thieves break in and steal. Right? But store up for yourself in heaven. Where moth and burning do not destroy. Where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Praise the name of Jesus. So as a believer, that invest both for now and for the future. All right? You know, when you give, when you tithe, I mean, when you give towards, generously towards the things of God, you are, and when you give to the poor, there are all kinds of givings, right? You know, when you give to the poor, when you support, you know, causes, when you are just generous, I want to encourage you, just have a generous heart. Now, sometimes we excuse generosity by saying, look, I'm poor. I don't have money. But you know, there are so many poor people in the Bible that gave. I mean, you'll be so shocked how many people that were poor, you know, Macedonian church, the poor widow. I mean, there are so many people like that. Being poor does not excuse you from investing and from giving. In fact, that is your ticket out of it. You see, when you allow poverty to control your mind and you become stingy, you know what happens to you? You end up staying poor. The way out of poverty is still investing. Investing in this world and investing in the things of the Spirit. So I want to challenge you to be a person of understanding. Be a person of wisdom. Don't just live your life with emotions. Don't just live your life running up and down. Don't just spend your life. You have the Spirit of God. Because you have the Spirit of God, you have self-control. And if you obey, you will eat the good of the land. Let us bow down our heads. So, Father, I thank you for this word that you put in my heart and that you have allowed me to share and deliver to your people. I pray this word will be seeds in our hearts and will bear fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen.